Somewhere in the provinces, two fighters are fighting in a ring, but suddenly a plane flies over and drops a flyer saying that they need pilots for the Air Force. It's war time, which means they all have to become soldiers. One of the guys is very afraid to go to war and escapes, but is caught by a detective just as old as he is. Even though both guys are from Korea, they are in Japan and they are being chased. Chunbei hides in a car with Choi Bei Dao. Bei Dao says that this car leads to the aviation school that the guy was anxious to get into. Chunbei jumps out of the car, but quickly realizes he'll just get killed if he doesn't jump back in. Soon the war in the Pacific was over, and the Koreans who refused to become kamikaze were tied up in the street as a sign of shame, they were waiting to die. Captain Kato ordered their release, explaining that they were not worthy of a heroic death, but also because he hated the Koreans who lived in Japan. Among those tied up is Bei Dal himself and his friend. Bei Dal's indignant friend is attacked by a soldier, but the young man stands up for his comrade, knocking out the attacking soldier. The commander sees this and offers the boy a fair fight duel, in which the young man quickly loses, though he fights as hard as he can and even manages to land several blows on the man. The commander wounds him with his sword, but still leaves him alive, is that really what life is all about? In the post-war era, no one particularly welcomes Koreans, so Chun Bei and Bei Dal have to earn by all means possible and experience hatred and oblique glances every single day. Chun Bei has made his own machine and invites everyone to use his machine around the clock. The worst starts when he forgets to pay the tax to the Yakuza guys, and they come to deal with him. They just break the machine that Chun Bei used to make his living. But all goes to his friend's defense, but almost gets himself killed by a mobster's blade. He pisses his pants when they nearly rip his throat open and send him face first into a puddle forcing him to humiliate himself in front of everyone. Chun Bei asks him not to grovel, but the guy realizes this is his only chance to survive in this cruel world, so Bei Dao licks the man's shoe in front of everyone and repeats to himself the humiliating words about being a pisser. A man in a hat standing nearby is watching. He intervenes and tells the dirty thug that he is wrong. They are clearly afraid of him, even though he doesn't have one arm. We realize that they really had reason to be afraid, as not a couple of minutes pass before almost all of them are on the floor after being punched by a strange man. When the fight reaches the critical point, their blades are near each other's necks. But the fight doesn't end with everyone being dispersed by the police. The stranger picks up Chun Bei and takes him to Badal's back alley. Together they go to a Japanese circus, where the guys are fed and told about the Yakuza guys. It turns out that his old acquaintance is Bom Su. Bei Dao recalls how he was trained by him since he was a kid, until men with guns came after him. Now, so many years later, they meet again, albeit under such dire circumstances. Bei Dao asked the man to teach him martial arts, as he had once done for him, but was refused, for the man had long ago promised himself he would not teach anyone. Then the young man spent the night on Bom Su's doorstep, and only then did he agree to continue teaching him the martial arts. One day, but all picks up Chun Bei after colliding with a car on the street and notices that in the back seat of the car sits none other than Kato himself. He is one of the important officials in the city and one of the strongest karate fighters. Bei Dal and Bom Su train day in and day out, just like in the good old days. The man drags the girl in the middle of the street, but Bei Dal can't do anything at all, because it's better not to mess with these people. No one intervenes, everyone watches in silence as the western soldiers mock the unfortunate Japanese woman. Bei Dao realizes that he can't stand by and stands up for the poor girl. The western soldiers are shocked by Bei Dao's blow, but soon run away. Bei Dao falls in love with the girl and Chun Bei notices it immediately. All his free time he keeps an eye on her, even though she doesn't remember what he looks like, she still looks for him. He even carries the cart she is sitting in. The young man begins to be sought all around after his heroic deeds, people hang posters with his image on them, and the price for his capture increases every day. One day Bei Dal is caught and has a gun pointed at his head, but it hits his body. He wakes up in his lover's house. Yoko hides him and bandages his wounds. The girl immediately realizes that he is the same hero who once saved her. Thus begins their love story. Together with Chun Bei and Yoko, they have a good time, passing the days and having fun like children. One day, a young man with bangs on his face approaches Bei Dal and leads him somewhere. He says that Bei Dal has the spirit of a fighter, that he is the only person who has ever struck the captain, but he also says that if he sees him again, he will kill him. One weekday, the Yakuza pass by Bei Dal and Chun Bei, the latter rejoicing, while the former quickly guesses that they are on their way to Balm Su to kill his teacher. Unfortunately, they do not make it to Balm Su in time, and Bei Dal sees only the corpse of his teacher. He sees the corpse of the only person who believed in him and was there for him, but suffered because of him. The circus guys picked up anything that looked like a gun and attacked the Yakuza gang. They came right into their base. A big scuffle ensued, chaos and violence. 
knives were ringing everywhere, trumpets were rattling, and people were falling down and getting up. Some did not get up at all. Bei Dao lost control, but Chun Bei steered him away from the scuffle in time, or he would have gone mad on the battlefield. It's not hard, especially when your friends and comrades in arms are dying before your eyes. They come back to the circus, but the guy immediately packs up and leaves without explaining anything to his loved ones. Yoko tearfully asks her to take care of herself, but the young man doesn't even turn around. He intends to be the strongest, no matter what it takes. Bei Dao goes into the woods and starts practicing martial arts even in the worst of weather conditions. He does push-ups on two fingers, climbs ice cliffs, and smashes rocks with his hands. When he thinks he's ready, he comes to the karate school and asks for a chance to prove himself. Everyone laughs at him, assuming he is weak, but none of his opponents are able to land a punch. Once the fight starts, they all end up on the floor. When it comes to the man in charge, he, too, is struck down by Bei Dao's hand and foot. The news quickly spreads around the world, and the fighter begins traveling around the world, defeating everyone in his path. Whatever the enemy, he finds himself defeated. Now he is no longer a pisser from the market, but a real fighter himself. Something was born and died in him the day his teacher was killed. At one point, Bei Dao decides to return home and is greeted by Yoko. While she is washing Bei Dao, she decides to kiss him. It finally happens, someone gives an outlet for their feelings. Really, the guy goes on his way. He promises he will fight as long as he has strength. He becomes a real star, people talk about his exploits, even children imitate him, they don't cut their hair and wear shabby kimono, just like him. Is he really the strongest fighter in Japan? Almost, but there's someone stronger than him. It's Kato, an old acquaintance of his. Kato holds a press conference where he says he doesn't think the guy is a hero, he still sees him as just a stupid ragamuffin. Bei Dao goes for a walk with Chun Bei, but the reporters rush at him, and in the crowd a man approaches him and stabs him right in the chest with a dagger. The man hides around the corner, and Bei Dao somehow survives. He hears Yoko being reprimanded for her guest, for she is a geisha, and they can only have one master. The boy receives a dagger from a stranger and a note inviting him to fight. He speaks to Yoko, believing that he may soon die in battle. Bei Dao is very afraid of never seeing her again. Yoko leaves because she can't see his pain, it's worse than death for her. She doesn't want anything from Bei Dao, she just loves him and asks him to stay with her, asking for his word that he won't fight again. The guy looks her in the eye, but only nods silently at her. They undress and make love. In the morning, Yoko leaves to make breakfast and Bei Dao is called to the phone by someone. It's Chun Bei, he needs help. He doesn't have time to eat breakfast and Yoko says goodbye to him without too many questions. He arrives at his friend's house and sees a dagger sticking out of his hand. The guy says that Yoko will be next, so Bei Dao goes to Kato's temple, but sees only his friend, who immediately starts swinging his sword, but Bei Dao proves stronger, even though all he has is his own fists. Of course, Kato sends the guy to jail. He comes to Bei Dao and tells him that he must fight him if he thinks he is a master and a better warrior, but here's the problem, the guy doesn't want to fight him because he promised his lover otherwise. Kato dreams of killing him in front of everyone, as do all his other cronies. They want revenge for their students. The guy arrives at the family of the murdered man and sits on his knees in front of his wife and son. He honestly says that he is the man who killed her husband. Bei Dao pulls his belongings to her and asks her to accept them, as a sign that he will not hurt anyone else, but he is only chased away and poured slop out of a bucket. He continues to help the family of the murdered man, but they are unwilling to make contact with him until Bei Dao helps the boy with the school bullies. They tease the boy for not having a father and for never having been to the top of the mountain. He responds by taking the boy and carrying him on a wooden stretcher to the very top of the mountain. Since then they become friends, mother and son begin to relate better to Bei Dao. The newspapers begin to write gossip about the boy, but he has no intention of returning to martial arts. The woman asks Bei Dao for one thing, to become the strongest in Japan, to be an example to the little boy. He renounces all promises and beliefs, washes his face, puts on his uniform, wraps his bandages and goes to fight against his nemesis who once left him alive. Before he fights Kato, he fights many other men, but they do not have time to make a hit before finding themselves on the damp ground and left to sleep among the long grass. Kato, the main instigator of the feast, only silently watches from the sidelines as the guy scatters his men. Soon it is his own turn. He puts his sword aside and silently waits for him to attack. Bei Dao says the man is just another mountain for him to climb. They look at each other and begin the duel, exchanging equal blows. Bei Dao advances, but Kato deflects his attack. The guy goes into a rage, but quickly regains his composure and changes his face. He keeps coming at the man, and goes at him as if he can't feel his blows. As a result of his attack, 
he stops his fist right in front of Kato's face without delivering a crushing blow, as he is now afraid of taking someone's life. Everyone lines up behind him and bows to Japan's strongest fighter. Bei Dao says he feels the wind after every battle, maybe that's why he's a wind warrior? The guy fights off an attacking bull, managing to break its horn with a single blow. He later founded the karate school, which became one of the most famous schools.